the night of the day, uh, no one obeyed me when I said, call in sick today. They fear their boss more than the preacher. So, but we're glad. We have some absolutely anointed men and women of God who are going to talk to us today. And so, how it's going to work here is in a moment, Brother Joel Kyle, our youth pastor, is going to be the moderator. And we've got seven people that we've, uh, we've taken a lot of questions and written them down. And we uh, have, so we're not going to have an open mic because I know most of you would ask normal questions. But a couple of you probably wouldn't. And the ones that wouldn't ask the normal questions would want the mic immediately. I've just done too many of these. And so we have some questions that we have failed to, to ask our panel. And the reason why it's such a diverse panel is I want, there's so many different levels of ministry here. And I want you to see things from different perspectives. And so we have Pastor Tuttle, for instance, who pastors the largest church in the Texas district, and it was one of the greatest preachers on the planet. So I want you to see them from Pastor Justin Gleason, who is a prophet of God and sees things like you saw yesterday. What an incredible message we heard yesterday morning, by the way, and just unbelievable how to conquer kings. Pastor Watts, who came to Dallas and started a church over 20 years ago in Fort Worth and has created an absolute revival center in Fort Worth and the NAM director for the district. Pastor Andrew Lucas, who is our district youth president. We give you honor this morning, by the way, also. We're glad you're here today. Our assistant pastor, Andrew Thomas, and I want, he's also in Everest, but he, God has accelerated his ministry to being the assistant pastor of Bible Tabernacle. I want you to see things from a different perspective, how we're doing things. And then... First Lady and myself will, uh, you know, if there's anything left to say, we'll say something. But would you welcome our panel to the floor tonight, this morning? Get you guys a seat. It's going to be fun. Y'all sit down, relax. If the Holy Ghost takes over, then get up and do your thing. But we're going we're gonna to have a good time this morning. Next year, we're not sure if we're going to do a panel or not. We'll see. Next year, we have uh, Mark Brown coming, and Frankie Taylor is going to be leading the music next year, and, and uh, Bishop Brian Kinsey's coming, and it's going to be an awesome conference April 30th to May 2nd, and we'll, we'll announce it tonight in further details. So without further ado, let's welcome the panel. Let's go. All right. Praise the Lord, church. God is good. And all the time. Awesome. I want to first, of course, say thank you to Patrick for this privilege and honor to moderate this panel. First time doing it, so I'm excited. Uh, but I do want to say right off the bat that this is, just isn't a time for cool questions and hear cool stories. They are going to speak to us, so prepare to, be, or prepare to receive a word. Have your notes ready. This is an incredible opportunity to hear from legends and heroes of the faith. So we'll get right into it because we are excited. And we're going to start with, what is your daily prayer routine? And I would love to start with uh, Pastor Tuttle. I don't think anybody heard whoever sang in this mic. Oh. <laughs> My daily prayer routine is uh, I get up. First of all, normally I wake up and Brother Harry has already texted me that he's prayed an hour. <laughs> so I'm very motivated to pray because I can't have him getting more ahead of me with God's favor. So, um, um, but, and then I, you know, for me it's, it's simple. I, I, um, I have a place in my home where I go and pray at home. And uh, then I, if that's short, I normally spend... 15, 20 minutes just in communion, meditation, um, and then I will go into my morning getting set and whatever, uh, exercise, and then I try to go to, after I've done exercise, ate breakfast, got my kids off to school, I go to the church. I think if you have a church building, and I know Revival Tabernacle, that's in your future, um, and you're able to go to the facility, uh, that, that that is a powerful place where, where I can really uh, touch heaven, and I go into the sanctuary, very intentional on that, if I'm having a situation, someone wants me to pray for them in my church. 
church, I'll find the place where they sit, and I'll lay on the pew or under the pew, pray for that person, I pray over where I preach, uh, and that, that has been a, a life-changing, ministry-changing thing for me, just prayer at the, at the house of the Lord, and then I go on over to the air, I said, Brother Harry, I pray two hours, and then I got a win, <laughs> that's my routine. That's awesome, that's fantastic. Well, since you mentioned pastor and how much he prays, and we all know how much he prays, I would love to hear a pastor's daily prayer routine. It's only when I get the mic that they mess with it. Um, so... I only, we text because we keep each other going. I think that's a big thing with, with keeping yourself accountable. If you're praying four days a week, you need a prayer partner because you're not praying enough. If you're praying three days, five days, you need someone that keeps you focused every day. And so we check in with each other and uh, keep each other accountable. Uh, my prayer routine is pretty simple. I get up and uh, I get my journal and uh, my pen and uh, my Bible and I start with a certain thing that I do. I start with praise, thanksgiving, then I go into repentance, I go into submission, and then uh, I start praying my list for my family and uh, the church members that I, that I pastor. Like he said, having a church building is something in our future. When, I, when we have that, I'll probably pray for them at the church building, uh, but now I pray for them at home around the kitchen island. I walk around the kitchen island, and then I get my Bible out, do some of my reading in the morning, uh, and then I usually go back into intercession and uh, supplication at the end. I pray the things I want after I pray the things I need to pray, and that means everything I want to God to do is at the end of the prayer meeting, and all the things that are important are at the beginning of the prayer meeting. So uh, pray for the building and all that stuff at the end, and and then throughout the day, talking to the Lord and listening for his voice, I think that uh, if you only pray, some people only pray at night. Some people are against early morning prayer. I'm about to stir this whole atmosphere up right now. Some people say, well, I don't pray in the morning. I pray all day long. I've been with them all day long. They're lying. They pray in their head. Uh, I think you can pray all day long, but I think if you don't, if you can't tell me the place that you have a you can't tell me the place where you pray, I question if you have a prayer life. You don't have a place. Jesus had a place. And so I know that sounds rough, but I, and, and people have different ideas on prayer, but I think the most important appointment of anybody's day is the first appointment, and that's with the Lord before there's any other conversation with a human being. There needs to be a conversation with God on where... What's going on in my day? Order my steps. Order my family's steps. How many times have, has things happened in our day we were not thinking about that morning, but because we prayed, order our steps, something aligned that day that we weren't expecting because of that early morning prayer. And I would just say this, and I'll hand it back, but if, if I journal uh, because when God speaks something, if a verse jumps off the page, or a, a word comes to me, I like to write it down so that way in the future I have reference. I've got journals just stacked up in my house. of just, just prayer journals, what happened in my prayer meeting. I always write the date, what time I start, and then and just go down the list of what I'm doing. For me, that helps me a lot. I love to journal what I pray. And, but Pastor Gleason has much more information on how to journal. Uh, he's, the, he's the best journaler in the room, I promise you. But it really does keep me focused on what's going to happen in my day. If I can actually ask real quick, is there any time where your prayer routine ever changes for a long period of time? Is there yes. something that would... You want me to answer that? Yeah. So, I mean, uh, I think prayer definitely, if you get in a rut, that's when I, I don't use music when I pray. Uh, I don't, the only time I ever have music in the background is if my prayers hit a wall and I need to make an adjustment or a shift. And so then I may put something on the background. I have found personally that the more I pray, the more distracting music is when I'm praying. I find myself singing and worshiping 
and, I'm, and there's nothing wrong with worshiping, but I, I kind of go with the flow of whatever the song is, so I feel the emotion of the song. That's the danger of music. We're already getting off course. I'll just get us back here. Music is awesome, but it should not interfere with your prayer life. It's about you talking to God, God talking to you, and sometimes sounds can be distracting. That's why, you know, the phone, music, all that stuff, just it needs to be away so you can hear the voice of God. On the question about is there ever a season for any moms in the room, um, I feel like when you have a baby, you know, and you're deep into motherhood, you're deep in diapers and all that, um, that can be a time when as a woman your prayer life will change. But I'll never forget Sister Haney, Joy Haney taught me something so powerful. She said, you know, when you have babies, don't let it stop you. She would be laying on the floor and bring all of her kids into the room, give them snacks, milk whatever they needed and say, I'm going to pray. And they'd be crawling over her. She'd be praying. And so the other day, um, we homeschool. And um, the other day I told Jet, let's go upstairs to your room and clean, buddy. And we were up there and I just began praying, trying to get my prayer in. Pastor does such a good job. Um, he's already, he's probably done for four or five hours. And so I'm up there with Jet cleaning up his room. And I just begin to pray. And he's like, why are you praying? I'm like, well, I'm, I'm trying to get my prayer in. And so we were praying and he started praying with me. We got the room clean. We went downstairs. We did school. And then a few hours later after lunch, he came to his dad and I, and he said, cause now we live across from an elementary school and, um, we have, you know, a burden to homeschool our kids, give them a different kind of education. But now there's this cute little elementary school across the yard and he sees those kids every day. And he's been wanting the last month to go to public school. And telling him we'll pray about it so I don't think it was a coincidence that morning I was up there in his room a few hours later he made his way up to his room and he came down and told his dad and I I prayed and God told me no and he said to what and he said to go to that little school so your kids are watching and there's power moms in praying they hear you they see you they pick it up it might look different in motherhood um, I'm in a season just now again where I'm able to just read books and take them in several at a time versus it was just like, you know, during a nursing feed, looking at my phone, trying to get some Bible in. But that's my question. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. And being a young, a young man myself, I can attest that I have vivid memories of the best time was when I heard my dad praying. It just changed my life, hearing my father pray for us. It just really impacts you. I want to jump over to Pastor Gleason, uh, the man who sees, <laughs> I would say. And um, I want to start with the greatest miracle you've ever seen. Maybe let's all check our mics real quick. <laughs> What's the greatest miracle I've ever seen? The first one that comes to my mind, this one's really unique. This was around 2010, 2011, and I was a youth pastor. And one of the uh, a dad of a girl in our youth group had uh, was diagnosed with uh, severe conditions in his liver, all throughout his digestive tract, just had disease all in his abdomen. And I remember in 2011, I, I lost, I quit counting after about 17 times going to see this man in the hospital. And anytime I would go in the hospital, his, just his abdomen would just be so swollen, his face so swollen from the, the infection in his body. Doctors didn't know uh, what to do for him, and they, they said, if you do not get a liver transplant, you're going to die. And coming in to pray for that, you know, you're up against something, you know, very, very intense. It's not like a headache, but when somebody has a terminal illness, it's, really test your faith. Well, I, I remember going in there to pray for him at about the 10th or 12th time in the summer of 2011, and he was so sick he could hardly talk, could hardly open his eyes. And I started to pray for him, and prophecy moved on me. And what flowed out of my mouth was, Brother Bill, you will not be healed, but you will not die. And I remember after I said that, I opened my eyes. I'm like, oh, my God, what did I just say? You will not be healed, but you will not die. And so I just 
and he just looked up at me and said, thank you. And, <laughs> but you know, I could feel his faith. He liked that you will not die part. And so uh, I uh, drove home and that just bothered me. Like, God, was that, what was that? I've never heard anybody prophesy anything like that, but I just, I wasn't going to go back on it. I just stuck with that. Well, as the year rolled on, he kept getting sicker and sicker until Thanksgiving week, 2011. I remember I was driving to the church on Tuesday and early in the morning going to the church to pray. And I came up on bad traffic in a place where there's normally not traffic in South Kansas City. And I got really frustrated being stuck in that traffic for about 45 minutes. And then I finally came up on our exit to take to get off on our church where our church exit is. I look over and it was a horrible accident and it looked like a fatality, a motorcycle accident. So finally, after I got through that, it all cleared. I got up to the office, I got situated, my phone rang and it was this brother's daughter. And he said, she said, Pastor, you will not believe it. My dad who's been on the waiting list for a liver just got one. And it appears it was a man who was killed in a motorcycle accident, and he's an organ donor, and dad is going to get his liver. So that man lived for 15, or yeah, 10 years after that. So um, that was unique, very, very unique. And the word was, you will not be healed, but you will not die. And so yeah, and he survived and had 10 more years of life, good life. So yeah, very, very, very so God heals and does miracles in unusual ways. Sometimes I've seen people healed immediately. Sometimes it's a three-year process. Sometimes it's a transplant. But every once in a while, God will give you a glimpse of uh, what he wants to do and how he wants to do it. And sometimes in very, very unique ways. It may not be how we hope for. It may not be the, you know, the most uh, glamorous lack of a better term, but, um, you know, nobody really knew about that, but me and that family, we kind of kept it quiet, but uh, it, it was something. So I've seen unusual miracles in the like that. greatest miracle I've ever seen, I get to see it every day. When I look in the mirror, because only I know where Jesus brought me from. And I don't ever want to lose the freshness of the miracle of Jesus Christ. Cussed me out, and then he walked out of my office and fell over the bed. They called the ambulance. They pronounced him dead, and uh, he came in, asked me what I wanted to do, and I said, "Let him live." And he came back to life, restored the uh, relationship. So that's probably the greatest. Uh, maybe for me, I've seen a lot of obviously physical. I think great any other miracles are relational. As a pastor. multiple men and filed for divorce obviously was shattered um, and was a minister in our church and had been married with three kids and uh, they came in and we began to pray and fast and ask the Lord to amend that relationship and it took about two years, two years later he came in my office, crumbled down, repented, uh, restored, God delivered him from homosexuality put his marriage back together. Our kids, today you'd never know it, and the beauty is no one knows it except me, that man, and that little family. That's a miracle, that's a miracle. He can put your family together. 
Come on. He can fix your family. He can restore your marriage. That's a miracle. I will share the greatest miracle I've ever seen. We have 12 grandchildren, believe it or not. Our sixth granddaughter, uh, they diagnosed her in the womb with pulmonary artesia. The surgeon said that the heart doctor said that she should be aborted. And I said, absolutely not, no way. And Valen was born. We happened to be in Thailand when she was born. Uh, they took her straight from delivery to uh, open heart surgery and put a stent in her heart. And they uh, diagnosed that she would have a surgery, at least seven more surgeries before she became 18. Uh, she's 11 now. They put the stent in. Uh, I happened to go to the doctor with her on the first her first year checkup. After the stent, they were uh, preparing to change the stent because of the size of the artery. And the <coughs> Asian surgeon uh, came to my daughter and I, and I was holding Balaam. And he said, what you do? I said, I pray to Jesus. He said, you keep do. I never see before. I don't know what he was talking about. Well, God, uh, pulmonary artesia means that the, uh, uh, the lung side of the heart didn't develop in the valve, so there, she had no valve on that side. Uh, at one year old, God gave her a valve, and they had to remove the stent, and she's never had another surgery.
What's that mean? <laughs> received the Holy Ghost in 1988. I was 22 years old. Uh, the only thing I knew to say is the Lord is my shepherd. That's the only Bible I knew. So I started out uh, empty. And I felt like I was always at a disadvantage because I didn't know scripture. So I buried my face in the word of God for the past 35 and a half years. And it has become a lifestyle for me. And so I say prayer and the word of God. I hear it everywhere I go. We heard it last night, bread and water. It's every day. And don't try to emulate anybody. Don't try to mimic anybody. Be you. Be the best you you can be and God will use you. It's so good. God only anoints who you are, not who you pretend to be, right? Mm. Uh, Priorities are, for me, are uh, obviously God. echo everything that everybody already said. I, I would say to a young preacher, a priority should be to distinguish yourself, perhaps, maybe find something unique that you can do to add value to your pastor or your church. But something that I'm just noticing with a lot of preachers, young preachers, is um, trying to be somebody else and a lot are preaching a lot of the same stuff, just kind of regurgitating the same things that they've heard other preachers preach. And I've even heard some telling other stories as if they're their stories and I've I've got video clips and people have s- s- said Jay this guy is telling your story that you told on your podcast and it's, <laughs> it's you so so don't do that but what I would say to every young preacher is uh, and they do that to you too believe me I think I thought I heard about another guy who got, who got cussed out and died and somebody else told that that was their story so but I'm glad to know the original so, so with preaching, you need to be focusing on a couple things. Number one, interpretation of the Word of God. Learn how to interpret it. That's what preaching is for, interpreting the Word of God. And then applying the Word of God. Apply the Word of God. And then if you really want to take it to another level and be, I guess, a little more distinguished than everybody else, learn how to properly arrange your message. A lot of times you may have a good point, but it's terrible to put it in the beginning. You may have a good point. Alignment, yeah, alignment and a proper arrangement. Uh, Make those a priority in how you present yourself. And this this works for new preachers, young preachers, whoever, youth pastors, uh, Sunday school teachers, any an influence out there, whoever you are, if you can do those things, I think making those a priority will really benefit you and you'll add a lot. I have one that works. Uh, This is amazing. Seek to serve, uh, not to be served. And let me just clarify what serving is. Serving is not singing. It's not preaching. It's rarely anything on the platform, anything visible. 
That's honor. A lot of people say, oh, I just want to serve. Well, then why don't you show up before church and help? The greatest servants in, that are in this room, you've probably never met, don't know their name. But this conference wouldn't be happening without the stuff they've done this week. And they've not been on the platform one time. Brother Bushmeyer, uh, where is he at? Is he in here? He's serving. He's been here at 7.30 every morning. Ran at the U-Haul himself to drive an hour away. Took some guys, Brother Cade, some other guys took time off work on Tuesday night to get all those purple chairs in case extra people came on Friday night tonight. They drove an hour one way, got the U-Haul, came back, parked it, then unloaded all the chairs. Brother Garrison, Brother Thomas, I see a few of them, Brother Puckett is in here. Brother Carlos worked like a dog the other day, carrying so many chairs in this building. That, to me, as a pastor, is far more impressive than somebody with an incredible thought. That thinks they're serving. And Brother Drew also served. And that's why Brother Bushmeyer speaking as a keynote speaker next year in Everest, because he earned it through serving his way into it. That's how I see it. Servant who will, I mean, servant who will take you to places that your gifting can never take you. Your gift makes room, but oftentimes we misinterpret that. We think it's my the gift from God, it's, it's your offering is what it means. It's something you give that creates room for you. So when you serve, like, like David, servants don't need swords. They just get the swords after the battle's over. They get Goliath's sword because they showed up serving others, and they end up the king before the story is over. That is why you serve in the kingdom of God. God elevates servants every time. but I'm raising three little preacher men and um, I was trying to look for a video to play it for you guys but I'll just say three things know the truth obey the truth love the truth that's what we're training our boys up. that right there is a mistake from a preacher we heard in camp meeting he said we teach our kids to know the truth but it's not enough to know it you have to obey it he said but it's not enough to obey it you have to love it because if you don't love it you'll leave it you have to love this truth, guys, or you'll leave it. Like he said, so your gifting is powerful, but you can walk away from truth if you do not love it. We need to love every bit of this one God, holiness, apostolic message that we have been given by our forefathers, by the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ. show up to do ministry nobody else knows they just see um, an available vessel somebody that they can pour out their problems to and even though you resonate with pain or disappointment in that moment you just listen you love um, you offer a prayer encouragement for me personally um, that's been hard because I went from being an evangelist wife who could sneak in sneak out. Some places knew who I was and those places didn't because um, I'm a true introvert at heart. But here, you know, God's really just um, required so much of my personality that I'm no longer a prisoner to it. <laughs> um, but I just think that might be the hardest part for a minister's wife is just having to carry yourself um, with just availability, the capacity that is required. But at the same time, it is such a privilege. And 
if you can ever get that shift to take place, it won't feel like a burden. It it really won't. It, it's it's a pleasure and honor to be here. Yeah, certainly. The heart is there's a lot of hard aspects to ministry, but I would say for me in the past few years it's been I feel like Then another thing I have learned is um, talking is really good. I used to think that the we shouldn't talk because if we talk, the devil will work when we talk. And I've realized in the last year or so that it's when we go silent, that's when the devil works. And I think talking, people just want to be heard. They just want to be noticed. They just want to be seen. And I think there are people in the church, they want status. And they want recognition and they want, and I've learned the loudest person in the room is the weakest person in the room. And these, these people that will set up chairs and add value and be a person of peace, they're, they're going to be in the pulpit. But, <laughs> you know, if, if you're the type of person that's going to email Brother Herring or somebody who's watching this from Brother Watts Church, Brother Tuttle's Church, and you email your pastors and you say, hey, next time I think you should say this and teach this and this and this, you're setting yourself up for not much success. <laughs> the best thing uh, that you can do is uh, don't act like you know more than your pastor, know more than your church, and I think uh, people just learn to get along and get on the same page and be in one mind and one accord. That's how you'll advance in ministry and not cause uh, uh, much trouble. Yeah. If I could add to this question, I think the pastor should just go ask you. Any more questions? Yeah. All right. Thank you. So, um, since, like you said, you can't really fight back and you know, ministry is all assertive, you know, people just scream at you the whole time. Um, how, what's the effect? Greatest question ever. <laughs> you know, there are there are just things about ministry that I just love that I find so much. <laughs> there's so many things. First of all, I want to say um, maybe there's young pastors, young youth pastors in here. And my first few years of youth pastor, I just got my teeth. And, uh, but I just didn't fight back. Like I talked about yesterday morning, I just kept marching in silence and I knew the things that I wanted to do it might take a year or two, but I'll get them done. And that happened. I would say uh, what keeps me coming back, there are three things that I just love to see on Sundays. And that is about 1104. I look up and look around the audience and to see that building filled up with people so hungry for God. And I'm like, and then to see at about 12, 15, 12, 20, that altar fill up and just people just dumping their trash on that altar and getting it right. I love that. And then about uh, 1, 15, 
not to walk out for lunch, I'd look and see that playground full of kids. And I'm like, you know, the brutal beginnings, the brutal things that I have to endure, it's, it's worth it. I see it. And I'll just tell you, I've let God, I quit fighting my battles. I let God fight my battles. And it's sad sometimes to see your enemies fall apart, but you got to let God have his way. But um, I don't know. I just, I just, I've never seen a lion fight a fly. Try to keep your influence and your mission and your big idea, you know, broadcast it out there for the whole group. But I just, I don't know, just, just to see so many people that love you and care about you, try to stay focused on them. And then uh, another thing, you know, I was, I was driving by here and I love uh, southern grass, Bermuda grass, I think is what you mostly plant in your yards. And I uh, was up, up where I'm from, we use fescue. I've just learned that if you want to get rid of weeds, the best way to do that is to have good grass in your lawn. And I've just learned if I keep on focusing on the good seed in the church, the, those weeds just, just, just kind of go. And uh, I'll, I'll end it with this. The body of Christ is a body, and sometimes the church needs a bowel movement. If you need to be flushed, we'll put you down there. I would say the uh, greatest challenge that, that I face as a flesh human being that Jesus demonstrated was he presented his identity 
accepted his identity. He promoted his identity. I and my father are one. In my name you shall cast out devils. He knew who he was. He was not afraid to express and operate in that authority. In our flesh, when we face struggles, we seem to have less confidence. In our flesh, when we have victories, we seem to have too much confidence. But Jesus knew his identity, and he also knew his purpose, to die for our sins. And so for me, knowing, maintaining my identity, I am anointed because God anointed me. Right, yes, sir. I am powerful because I have the Holy Ghost. I am forgiven because I've been baptized in Jesus' name. I'm washed in the blood, knowing who I am. Yes, amen. Incredible patience for me. And me too. And I would say, uh, I would say uh, loving your enemies for me and um, in a time when there's so much global instability it'd be uh, very difficult to be kingdom minded and uh, even just within culture wars within our own country you know, to look past all of that and do what Jesus taught people that are against maybe your values don't see it the way you see it you've got to think like heaven yeah. and yeah. Yeah. love the enemies and, I, and when you do that love is so powerful yeah. greatest uh, it's, more, it's greater than prophecy. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Sir. Because prophecy will one day cease. All the visions and dreams that will one day cease and all that will remain for all eternity is love. Yeah. And uh, love will give you great, great influence. It's, it's really a hidden power yeah. to have, to love human beings. And that is incredible. I highly recommend the book, The Unflawed Leader by Bishop Stan Gleason. About the life of Jesus, I think it's the greatest book I've ever read on the attributes of Jesus. If you want, if you haven't read that, you should. Uh, but I would say, all everyone, everyone's comments are right. Uh, forgiveness uh, to people who walk away from you and disappoint you. Uh, Jesus was he had five thousand people, and most of them left over one sermon, and then he got up on a cross and forgave them all. And uh, to me, that's just, that's incredible when you conquer disappointment in people and and knowing that they're going to let you down and for truly forgiving them. Uh, forgiveness is when you hear their name and you don't cringe or get a bad thought. You, you can say you forgive them, but if, if, if I say their name and instantly in your spirit you don't like that person, you haven't forgiven them, even if you don't say anything. But Jesus forgave every person. Uh, he constantly showed mercy. Obviously, he was the most humble human being. And I think forgiving people who don't ask for it, don't want it, don't think they need it, and think you owe them an apology. And I think having to make relationships right. Jesus was a peacemaker. And in this world, it's, it's everybody's competing with everybody. It's dog eat dog. I got to be on the top. And there's very few peacemakers, especially in the ministry. And I think being a peacemaker is, is, requires forgiving and apologizing when you're not wrong and loving people and connecting instead of competing with them. And I've said this everywhere, but connection kills competition and competition kills connection. If I connect with you, I won't compete with you. But if I compete with you, I won't connect with you. And Jesus wouldn't compete with anybody. He just forgave everyone. Be a peacemaker everywhere you go. Yeah, yeah. Try to find, even if you have to be the, the, to take the blame, take it so you can go forward and the relationship can be right. Um, I'm, mine would be mercy. I think extending mercy and grace on a continual basis. Um, you know, going back to the question about what's the hardest thing about being a pastor's wife? You know, that ties into it, constantly praying, God, let me extend mercy and grace, the mercy and grace that I need for him in this position through, you know, being a mom, being a wife, constantly just, you know, being like God in that way.
honestly, I think submission is where it's at. If you can learn to submit yourself to God, submitting yourself to the kingdom of God. Uh, he, I, I'm blessed to own a great business, and, and I, I have a way of blessing employees that make my business better. And so the mission of the kingdom is to establish a government system. God is in order. God in order. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, right? So what, what are we? We're, we're ambassadors of a kingdom. We are establishing a kingdom order. So when I, if I want to have his favor on me, I have to make his kingdom my priority. I submit myself to his kingdom regulations, his kingdom order and structure, and in so doing, uh, he blesses and pours out his favor upon me. So uh, I think that, that that's a, that's a, what would be a primary answer there. I would say um, the favor of the Lord is built upon a relationship with him, a deep relationship with him. God wants, he wants communion with, with humanity. He's looking for a worshiper, somebody to pray to him and seek him. And then I think somebody to represent him very, very well and be about his business. And if we're not careful, we can get really good at doing church and kind of not making it all about God, you know, um, you know, coming back to a prayer time about a month ago, I just was really kind of going through it and I was praying kingdom prayers about this and about people and ideas and it was like God was nowhere to be felt at all. And sometimes I wonder, does God even care sometimes about how I wanted to organize and all of my worries, it's like, God, can I have your emotional alignment? Can I feel your worry? And he's, he doesn't worry. He doesn't know what worry is. And it was like after an hour of just pouring out a list in that journal, it was like God said, can we just talk and just love on each other? And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> and when I did that, things started coming into alignment. And I felt his favor uh, come upon me. So uh, favor is poured out in love. It's love. Loved Jacob and couldn't stand Esau. And uh, uh, John, the revelator, he was beloved because he was just so near to the Lord. So uh, I think having that deep, loving connection with God uh, will gain so much favor from, from heaven in your life. I think that uh, that's incredible, both those answers, because relationship with the Lord and submission you can't have any favor without those it's possible. One of the secrets I found as a young evangelist was abnormal sacrifice um, was something that I found that crossed pathways into favor. And I'll just use a brief story that something that I, this, this story showed me this secret. And I was scheduled to preach a uh, Holy Ghost rally in a city in Florida on a certain weekend. It was about two months away. I went to a conference two months earlier and one of my heroes was preaching at that conference. And I had never met him and I got to be around him at that conference. And he said to me, I want you to come out to California on this weekend in two months and work the altars for me while I do a Holy Ghost crusade. Well, the problem was it was the same weekend of my, my big Holy Ghost rally. It's a full-time evangelist. We had Jude was three months old, I think, two months old. And so my I was scheduled to preach Friday night in Florida and Sunday morning in Louisiana. And but the Lord said, This is a pathway to the favor of God. To be or sometimes to get around favor, you, to get favor, you need to be around people who are favored and be a sponge. And so I canceled the, the Louisiana thing. I preached the uh, Friday night deal in Florida. And a bunch of people got the Holy Ghost. And at 3 in the morning, we went. In fact, it was at Brother Collins Church. Or she, we got in the, went to the airport at 3 in the morning. And we flew from, from Tampa to Sacramento with a baby. And we got to the hotel. And we were dead tired just to get up the next morning and work the altars. And... 
And I, at that time, I, I was just obeying. And sometimes when you're obeying, you're walking into the favor of God without even realizing it is a big sacrifice. And you don't see it as a big sacrifice till it's over, what just happened. Anyway, long story short, worked the altars, and God moved, and when so, someone at that church saw us working the altars, and they invited us back and in, uh, two months late to come back in two months, and a five-week revival broke out where 400 people received the Holy Ghost, over 200 were baptized, and in the next 10 years from that revival, we, we, we were launched into the favor of God. And I think it was because there was a test of sacrifice. And there's the praying and there's the fasting, and there's the relationship. But sometimes God will have you do something. Sometimes it's giving. It's, it's giving something you don't want to give. But that is a secret. That's, it's not all the time, but pay attention to the secret, abnormal sacrifices God's requesting of you. They are secret passageways into the favor of God. Yes, I was a few years ago uh, studying on grace because it's not a real popular subject in the apostolic church. And I wanted to make sure I understood it. And so I was reading and I, I clicked on the Greek word and I was just going to every scripture that had that Greek word. And what I found in that study is that the word grace and the word favor are the same Greek word. And so I put the two together and I said, okay, how do I find favor? By the grace of God. By the grace of God. All these things are necessary, but staying in the will of God means I'm staying in the grace of God. And that's where I find the favor of God. I, I am by adoption a foster child. Tom Foster is my pastor. And that's literal. I was uh, born again in the church and served there for uh, 13 years with the understanding that I would become the next pastor. And when the time came, the pastor decided that it was not the best idea for me to become the pastor told me that I would have to leave. 
And I said, where do I go? He said, I think you ought to go to Tom Foster's. And I'm like, what a curse. <laughs> that, that was a joke. <laughs> I, I tried not to be too excited because that was 2001. That was the second year of the uh, second of the 500 Soul Revival, 2000, 2001. And so I went there. I was working full time at the church. I had no job. I had no income, uh, family, <clears throat> and said, I, I, "I'll give it. I'll give it a month." We had enough to survive a month, and within three weeks, Pastor Foster offered me a position on staff at Dallas First Church in that revival church. And from there, Pastor Foster sent us to Fort Worth to start the church. And so, Tom Foster is my hero. And the main reason is because I would not know anybody here without him. Anybody, nowhere would, would there any would I be today without Tom Foster. So uh, I know it's dangerous to put so much credibility in one man, but he's proven himself to be humble. He's proven himself to be faithful, and he's been there when nobody else was. Yeah, and my parents as well. Uh, three weeks and I share a similar story. And we were raised on a mission field. My parents, my dad's my pastor. My mom prayed me through the Holy Ghost in our bedroom, my bedroom. Uh, and uh, my dad's been my pastor and has been to this day. Consistency. Uh, he's, you know, incredible. Uh, Brother Herring, he's one of my heroes. I love him very much. I admire his ministry. He's a dear friend of mine. Uh, there's men, of course, that I admire in the pulpit. But as far as to say they are a hero, I think it's just a well-rounded husband, father, mother, woman of God. That are uh, that's what makes you go. Yes. Yes. Uh, my heritage, my father, Stan Gleason, his dad, Wendell Gleason, both uh, tremendous teachers and preachers of the Word of God, and uh, my mother's father, Charles Dyson. say Eli Hernandez. He preached a lot in our church uh, when I was a kid. He was the one that, I don't know, kind of brought me forward. I was about 10 years old and he says, I want Justin Gleason to come up here. And I stood by him. He said, I want everybody who's got pain in your body to come up here right now and stand across the front. And uh, he said, God is going to use this young man tonight. And he said, and I want you to just repeat after me, okay? I said, okay. He said, don't worry about it. Just repeat after me. It's going to be all right. So he said, walk up to the first person here. And he said, ask him what pain do you have in your body? And this lady goes, my neck is, goes, I'm in so much pain. He said, put your hand on her head. I'm 10. I put my hand on her head. And I'm pretty sure he told me, told me, shake her head a little bit. <laughs> I, I'm pretty <laughs> He did. Because, I don't know, it just, just a little bit of that just kind of, I don't know, breaks people's pride or something. I don't know. And he just said, say, by the authority of the word of God. I said, by the authority of the word of God. <laughs> by the power of the name of Jesus, by the power of, I command this pain to leave. She fell out, neck healed. Down the line, back pain, knee pain, this, this, this. Just repeated after him, healing after healing. And uh, so that, that just always, and that's just the way I do. I, I'll start usually at the end of the altar and just kind of work through and I've never realized that till now but it's it's just I started it and just go down the line so that was a, a hero moment a very very influential in my life and then I would say and some of you are going to laugh but it was uh, Charlie Mahaney was a, a hero of mine and uh, from him I observed and learned a, a style of preaching and a style of communication that I really liked and it's three things that I try to put in all of my preaching, sitting at the dinner table talking, and that is insight, humor, and fire. And Charlie Mahaney had that. He really, really had that. Uh, he could preach the text in a way that you just never dreamed of. And But then he would say something outrageously funny, like uh, he would say, he goes, I don't understand why people don't whip their kids. He said, when, when Nikki and Mike and Shelly was young, I'd say, 
Come here, you turkeys, and I take off my belt. Whoosh, 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 and <laughs> give him a whooping. Right in the middle of his message. <laughs> and then would just throw down fire, and you'd go from like, wow, that's amazing, to ha, 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 then to, oh, God. <laughs> and um, I think if you're looking for a hero, look who speaks the most to you. And then nobody really ever taught me to preach. I observed it, observed it, and I just observed what they did, and I took note of it and analyzed it. And if you will learn to do that, you'll have heroes in your life and maybe somebody that you don't necessarily have a close friendship with, but it's like a, a distant influence you know, in your life, and you can develop heroes. Wow. Uh, my parents, obviously, uh, growing up, taught me so much and uh, my mom's faith and my dad's discipline uh, were just uh, at a front row seat too every day but um, you know just from preachers uh, Billy Cole and, uh, and Verbal Bean, James Kilgore and uh, Eli Hernandez and Steve Willoughby and people that are you know, a lot of are not even here, Kenneth Haney People that were just, and then, and then the ones that are here. I, I, I loved as a kid to watch Jeff Arnold preach, and I loved to watch Wayne Huntley preach, and and I loved to just to just to see, uh, you know, these were just giants, you know, that could that could move any atmosphere. And Brother Cunningham, and just so many people. Bishop Gleason. I could. I have a list. <laughs> I have a list of heroes. Uh, Brother Tuttle is one of them. He's, he is one of my heroes, even though he's my best friend, because he lives it at a higher level than almost anybody I've ever met. Uh, I'd say this, my pastor, Brian Kinsey, is one of my greatest heroes for sure. I think what makes someone a hero to me now versus 20 years ago when I was young, when I was young, it was how, you know, how famous, how powerful, how I only heard what people said about these people. And if you ever get a chance to meet this person, and, and you're just in awe. And that made him a hero or, or they're preaching. But over time, my heroes love me. They care about me. They don't care how good I preach. They care about me. They love my kids. They love my wife. You know, I, I used to say this as I evangelized 20 years that and when I first started, I wanted to preach at all the, the big churches. You know, that's your dream. But at, at the end of the 20 years, I wanted to preach at the, at the churches where the pastors loved my family. Because they were a dime a dozen that wanted me to just to come in and, and blow it up. But the ones that Pastor Tuttle, Pastor Gleason, Pastor Johns, that loved my kids, loved my wife, they're my heroes. That Pastor Kinsey he loves my kids. He loves my family. And, you know, uh, Jude's favorite preacher is, is Matt Tuttle. And if I ask Jude who's his hero, it's sitting right here, right here. And let me just say this. I want my kids' heroes to be preachers and preachers' wives. I do. Because every kid's, you know, the, the boys, they have the athletes, and athletes were heroes for mine growing up, you know. Then I realized that the athlete doesn't care about me. The famous basketball player does not care about me and never will care about me ever. But that preacher up there that takes time to talk to me, that I want that, I want that for my kids. So last night when we were leaving the church, Jed said, Dad, got a new favorite preacher. It's Rashidi Collins. <laughs> I said, I love it, buddy. You know, uh, you know. I was a little nervous when Chase in our church said he was moving to Tampa last night. I was like, that, I was like whoa, Chase. <laughs> I want that for our people. I want our people in our church that when preachers come in, they think, yes, I, I want to be around that. I want to be around them. That's why, because there's something about men and women of God. I mean, I know that men are our heroes as guys, but Joy Haney, Shirley Cole. I mean, I got to be at Sister Cole's house and have a relationship with her for two years before she died, hanging out with her, talking. I talked to her the day she died on the phone. She took me to the spot in the house 
where she said, uh, this is where I, I laid for six days in the last Ethiopia crusade. I only got up to use the restroom, and I stayed on this floor until I got the call that 65,000 had received the Holy Ghost. And I looked at her and said, okay, you're a hero. And then she yeah. took me to the, to the room. She said, this is where I pray every night from 9 to midnight. This is after she's buried her only child and her husband. To me, that just, that, that just messed with me. Heroes are people that they did the abnormal. They did things that others didn't have to do. And, and so your hero should be people that love you, impact you, but they, they, they do abnormal things. There's right. something about them that draws you to them. Wow, what a, what, a, what a sacrifice this person made. And I'll say this lastly, and some other heroes I have are members of this church. Because there are people in this church that have suffered. And, and like I said, no one knows them. But they have been to hell and back. And I don't ever tell them this, but when I think of them when I'm, when I'm wanting to walk away from stuff, just, this is it. when people are giving me crazy stuff to deal with, I think of other people in the church that are living a life of sacrifice, buried their family, gone through hell, and you would never know it, so committed. And I honor all of my heroes that are in this room. Several of you I've mentioned already, you serve. Thank you for what you've done for our family. For this. My uh, first one would be uh, a 16-year-old altar boy raised in a Catholic church who um, decided to make a family with my mom, who was 15 when she became pregnant. They um, were pro-life before it was a movement, and um, being a Catholic boy, it was very disgraceful to have gotten a girl pregnant, but they, to this day, um, are still together, and... I don't have the strong, rich heritage, but they did the best. And I can remember in the midnight hour hearing my mom, a first-generation um, apostolic lady, warring in the spirit and praying. And still to this day, I have the book that she used that taught her to pray, and it was Joy Haney, When Ye Pray. And at that revival that we went to in Stockton, California, um, both of my worlds collided when I felt like in the spirit. My mom could only take me so far. She wasn't in ministry. But a spiritual handoff took place with Joy Haney. And there's been such a void in our life since she passed. She was our prayer warrior. She was a mentor to both of us. And so my mom, my dad, and Joy Haney would be my heroes. Prayer life impacted me the most, Nathaniel Haney. Uh, he prayed uh, eight hours a day for nine months straight. This is the story they told me before I met him. At the end of that nine months, he prayed 12 hours a day for six months. And uh, that, as a young preacher, that just did something in me. That when you complain about praying 30 minutes, there are men and women of God that are praying six to eight hours a day. Verbal being, uh, I never met him, but his prayer life was just amazing. And I think what makes a prayer life amazing is the ability to linger longer than a few minutes. I'm just going to make sure everyone gets that. And Nathaniel Haney did teach me something about prayer that I've tried to teach others, and that is this. He said, prayer is a river, and the water is the spirit. And he said, most people get in the river for their prayer, and when the rapids are moving and they break through, and then the rapids start to slow down, they get out of the river, and they think their prayer time is over. But he said, the river will almost come to a complete stop, but there's just as much water in the slow-moving current of the river as there is in the rapids. And he said, if you learn to linger in the river and stay in it, you could go from praying five minutes to 20, 
from 20 minutes to two hours. And that messed me up as a young preacher because I realized that there is a place, and I know people say, oh, it's not about time. Well, let me just talk to you about it for a second. Jesus asked the disciples, could you not at least pray one hour? The old timers believed if you didn't pray an hour a day, you were going to hell. That's read the books. They really did. So, oh, almost everybody's going to hell in here. Um, but, but let me just say this. Uh, Sam Every taught me something one time. He said, when you pray, you get in the spirit. He said, a day is the Lord's a thousand years and a thousand years is a day. He said, so when you get in deep prayer, the clock will seem off to you. He said, have you ever felt like you prayed an hour and you looked at the clock and it had been 12 minutes? He said, because that's because you crossed the veil from flesh into the spirit world where time is not the same. And sometimes you feel like you prayed 20 minutes, Pastor, and you've prayed two hours. He says, because you are not in this time zone anymore. You are alone with God. That messed me up. I don't have to pray an hour. I can pray 20, but that 20, I need to get into a place where it felt like an hour. And so prayer lives, I mean, there's books and things like that, but just hearing personal stories from people, but their time with God, you know, Nona Freeman and uh, Joy Haney. Joy, Joy Haney said to me one time, I said, how is it that every time I talk to you, it's like you just came out of a prayer meeting with Jesus? She said, that's because we just came out of a prayer meeting with Jesus. And I said, well, can I ask you, how long does it take you to get in the spirit when you pray? Because she said she has a chair by her bed and she just turned it down. She said, what do you mean? I said, how long does it take you to get out of the flesh and get in the spirit? She said, immediately. <laughs> Have you noticed that how a lot of ladies can just start praying and instantly they're like, oh, no, no. And us guys are like, oh, God, I repent again. <laughs> Sorry, I was a jerk yesterday. Forgive me for my attitude. And we go down this like list of condemnation and shame. And the ladies are just like, it's the age. Like you were just drinking Starbucks in the lobby. Instantly you're like, I'm in heaven. That's awesome. I'm happy for you. I don't know that dimension. I, I yearn for it. I'll probably never get it. But prayer lives that change my life, they usually linger longer than most people pray. prayed me into this world, she could pray me out of this world, and so that's a, that's a prayer life that, that changed my life. Literally, I have life because of a mother who prayed, and I'm alive today because of a mother who prayed. Come on, mamas, you keep praying. You keep praying. Amen? I uh, have observed a lot of prayer lives and read a lot of books about it. I'd recommend Brother Tony Bailey. You can still probably find his books somewhere out there. He's got one.
every time that you stand or sit, all you do is say, oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God, for about an hour. I, you know, is that how we talk to each other? Oh, hi, oh, hi, oh, hello, oh, hi, oh, hi, oh, hi. And then if your prayer life, there's times, you know, when it's war and it's on, but with connections to people, you know, when Brother Herring and I talk to each other, I don't say, Brother Herring, how are you today? Yeah, you know, I don't, we talk. Now, he and I both preach hard, but we don't talk to each other that way. And I think God sometimes is just like, oh, you know, he wants to be welcomed and loved in, in his presence. So I think a conversational prayer will take you to another level. But I, after observing powerful prayer, lives and observing prayer templates in the Bible, like the prayers of David, the prayer of Jabez, the prayers of a lot of the prophets, the prayer of Jesus, the Lord's Prayer, the prayer of uh, Paul, John, all of them. I grew up, and then Brother Stone King, the Haney's, uh, a lot of uh, people that have already mentioned prayer. Um, I'll tell you another one was C.P. Thomas. C.P. Thomas don't know him, he's from India, an apostle, phenomenal, you can find him on YouTube. Back in the 90s, he used to stay in our home, and mom and dad would give him my room down in the basement, and so I'd sleep on the couch, and my mom would brew a pot of coffee for him at about 10 p.m. and put it there in the room, the pot of coffee, and so I'd lay there on the couch, and at night I could hear him in their praying, and it was a lot of But his prayers were so communicative with the Lord. And I can tell you, just laying there on that couch, I could feel the glory of God just fill that house. And um, I grew prayer into three things from everybody that I've observed and everything I've read in the Bible. And that is if you will learn how to praise, petition, and proclamation. All of the prayers of the Psalms, even the Lord's Prayer, is praise, petition, and proclamation. If you can learn to do all three of those things, a lot of the Haney's books are of that. I've, I've read them. They're, that's what's the three common things in there. Praise, proc, or praise, petition, and proclamation. Do those three things. I think you will have a, a prayer life that you will enjoy. You will feel God and start moving mountains and doing all kinds of things. Amen. seen it before or since then. And the Lord spoke to me and said, they don't have houses, they don't have jobs, and they're going to eat today. I just, uh, I'll never forget it. I, I almost got out my phone to take a picture, but it was, I was like, I can't, this is too precious to do that. And I just sat there and wept. And it was like God was saying, I don't, I don't want to hear about your worry, you're going to be okay. And so I want to feel your faith. So figuring out those things that God does and he wants and thinking like Jesus. You know, you look at the prayers of Jesus. Uh, you know, in his, in his last moments, he's 
giving is what he wants to hear. And there's not a lot of griping and complaining. Complaining, that, you know, for Israel, it was that the ground opened up and they were swallowed. You know, do you hear Moses complaining? No, he's interceding, trying to stop the madness. And I think if you can be about the Father's business, that's when God will bow down his ear to you. You'll attract angels to your prayer life. I would just say uh, Verbal Bean's book, Prayer, will echo what he's saying. Verbal Bean has a chapter in there on the channels of prayer and how, like, a truck driver driving down the road has a CB radio. And if you want to talk to that truck driver, you can be on a certain channel. And if he's on the same channel, he can hear you and you can hear him. Uh, but if you're on a different channel, you know, and so he talked about prayer, supplication, thanksgiving, and intercession being the four channels. And God's on one of those every morning. And you get to find out which one God wants from you uh, to get a breakthrough. There is a breakthrough every morning if you want it, but you have to get to the channel that God's wanting to talk to you in. And so sometimes, like, uh, I want to talk about the building or the message I'm going to preach that night, and I'll, and I'll be going, and I'll just feel this, no, we're not talking about that right now. And if I keep forcing that, I'll get nowhere, I'll be frustrated, I won't feel God, it will be empty. But if I change the subject... And I, and I find, and sometimes you just got to go from thing to thing. You don't know, well, what's the Lord want me to talk about? Sometimes he just wants me to listen. What am I supposed to do? Just keep looking until you find the thing that you feel, witness in the Holy Ghost, and then you begin to break. That's the secret to a breakthrough, is, is finding what God wants to talk to you about. God deserves what he, here, if you want to hear the voice of God, he gets to talk when he wants, about what he wants, and where he wants. So that means your time is is his, the subject matter is his. You can't have these blocked off and this person I think you're mad at, don't talk to me about that. And don't, don't try to interrupt my sleep at 3 a.m. If, if you really want to hear the voice of God, God gets to choose the time, the place, the subject, the content, and you will hear his voice and he will talk to you. Open yourself, and let me say this, he controls the length of the prayer meeting too. So God, I got seven minutes, let's go. Well, you, 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 that's, that's called you're not important to me. You need to find a place where God, I don't know you work and everything, but you need, there needs to be something in us that says, Lord, I'm not leaving until you're done. I'm not, I'm not going to assume everything's okay until I know you have let me know it's okay. That's prayer. That's how you hear the voice of God. Yeah. 
and it, it was a Sunday evening, August 12th, 1993, um, and we were walking our dog on a Sunday night, it was a nice evening, um, and we'd had church all day long, I'd heard my dad preach multiple times that day because of how our services were at multiple congregations, none of those moved me, none of those, you know, changed my life, so we're walking our dog, lightning flashes off in the distance, and my dad just simply said, tell me the Lord's going to be that way. Lightning is like thunder. Tell me it's going to be the way. Um, and those who are ready are going to be taken. Those who aren't are going to be left. And that was it. We walked on. About five minutes later, his little five-year-old knee breaks down to sob. He's trying to get the words out. And my, my parents are like, you know, well, what's, what's wrong, buddy? And, and I said, you know, Jesus is coming back, and I'm not ready. Yeah. And, and we stopped there on the side of the road with our dog there. And, and, and my dad said, you know, people can repent. And, and so little five-year-old me just, you know, repented of all the terrible horrible dirty, rotten things I'd ever done in my life, and, and you know, and then just a few minutes, my dad said, why don't you begin to worship God, and I can still see it so, so clearly, my dad holding me in his arms, and I lifted my hands, and just needed nothing oh, to hold the Holy Story. Spirit. Took me back, baptized me in the bathtub, and uh, wow. that was really exciting, and so, you know, sometimes the simplest messages are, are the most impactful in, in people's lives. Question, my memory went back to January of 1990. My first time to ever, I'd just been in the church a year and a half, my first time to ever attend because of the times. And Jeff Arnold preached the message unexplainable but undeniable. And I have found my walk with God over the last 35 years to be exactly that. I can't explain anything that's happened. Message has impacted me for all these years. It still does. I said that I've been serving for season because I had the message of blow your name out of that city and go back like, man, what, what? I didn't get anything out of it the second time, uh, or vice versa. So, but some that have endured the seasons, um, of course, my current favorite is uh, War for Your Miracle. I think that's what you preached on Wednesday night, wasn't it? <laughs> Increase the check. Increase the check. <laughs> Whatever Brother Harry has preached last is my new favorite. Let's just put it that way. Um, but ones that have endured maybe have Israel No Sons by Brother Wayne Huntley. It impacted me when it was preached, and it impacts me. In, it has impacted me in every season of my life. And so that that's an enduring word in my life. Um, and coming out of the cave, I'm pretty much all of Jeff Arnold's. <laughs> Uh, stuff from it would, would be life changing and impactful to me. But uh, preaching is such a, a powerful tool, it's such a wonderful tool. I don't listen to music much. I just constantly listen to preaching. It just it feeds my soul. I love it, and I'm not belittling music. I love it, uh, kind of. But I really love <laughs> preaching, and uh, and, I, and I I mean that sincerely. So thank God for the word. I just thank you for great preachers. Amen. I love this truth. Bible in Ethiopia. 
And so that just really stuck with me. Uh, some other uh, sermons, it was Ken Gurley's Worth the Wait preaching. Uh, that really helped me and my wife, actually. Uh, we were both at uh, the same youth congress when, when Brother Gurley preached that. And my wife and I were both pure uh, when we got married. So those teachings uh, really impacted me. And I use a lot of that content, you know, kind of justinized it. I think that messages are seasonal, you know, that they impact you. I will just say that uh, there's so many. The one that I listen to the most is Inspiration to Die by James Kilgore. The one that messed with me the most and scared me the most and put me on my face and made me change my life was a prayer request from hell by Matt Tuggle. I was in that room and that that, that messed with me. Uh, Jeff Arnold's old Because of the Times messages back in the day, uh, miracle looking for a vessel, come out of your cave. Uh, when, when we stop measuring, the miracle will start. Uh, those were just, you know, those are preacher messages. Wayne Huntley, those, those get you fired up. But the ones that, that dig you out of depression and dig you out of discouragement, those are the ones that mean the most to me. Uh, and listening uh, to preaching when you're low is, the, is one of the greatest things you can ever do for yourself. Your answer is not on social media. Your answer is not in the song. Your answer is in the word of God. To listen to preaching and you'll be encouraged to get out of it. Pastor Tuttle preached our camp meeting here last, in this district last year. Preached on Lazarus the last night and I never wanted to preach on Lazarus again. I was like, there's nothing there. There's, no, there's nothing else to dig out. We have dug every cell out of Lazarus's body. So when you go that far, there's, you know, and then when you look at your congregation in a couple of weeks, I'm going to preach out of John 11. They're like, please don't. We know everything about that story. You know, great messages are really like, I, I don't want to ever preach this subject again because everyone just heard the greatest message on this subject. That inspires me. Uh, it's an amazing thing to hear uh, men of God, uh, ladies of God, that can, that can open the word and see things. I, I'm different. Uh, uh, I like the word. Uh, a lot of people like, you know, inspirational stories and this is what happened in my life. But me, I, I get fed by... What, what do you see in that scripture that I've never seen, that I've, I've read over and over and over, and, and, and now I see it because you're showing me? Uh, that does, as a, maybe it's because I'm a preacher, but for me, nothing speaks to me like the revelation from the Word of God. It, I don't need to have four points about this, and, and, and this is going to really make some people really mad, but, you know, it's our conference, so deal with it. Uh, but... If you have to, this is going to be, if you have to use stories about the world all the time, and this article said this, and this article said that, but I can't leave your service with one thought from the Bible, you don't study very much. And so you study, but you're not studying the word of God, and it's inspirational in the moment. I want to hear, I want to know what thus saith the Lord, and, he, and I, I'm thankful for the stories. But there needs to be word in every message. I want to hear from God.
to a new sense of when he went to Fort Worth. I was raised in Fort Worth. I grew up in the city. I know the city. It's always been my dream to convert Fort Worth to Christianity. And my initial dream is 3,000 people receive the gift of the Holy Ghost from downtown Fort Worth in one service one day. And that's what I believe we're going to see in that. That's my dream, and that's what we work for every day. That's going to wow. happen in Jesus' name. Amen. I dream as well. I think it's the same. It's always been revival to see a harvest uh, locally in my local assembly. Uh, as I tell my church all the time, I'll quit, and every person in my city has a gift of the Holy Ghost right. baptized in Jesus' name. And then I won't quit. I'll go to the next city. So I want to see revival. I dream of revival. Yes. The lost being saved. In my city, and then to be a part of a global revival, a harvest that's, I want to see revival right here in Frisco. I want to see revival in Kansas City. I want to see revival in Fort Worth. I want to be a part of a global, I dream of it. I, it keeps me awake at night, and uh, and I believe that, that it's going to happen. We're going to witness an incredible harvest in this house. My dream these days is... Those are incredible answers. My dream is that my kids go to heaven. N nothing matters if they don't go to heaven. There's not, I, I don't care if they, I, I want the entire city of Dallas saved, but if my kids are lost, I, how am I gonna enjoy heaven? Uh, it's all that matters to me. It's, uh, I, I, I dream with the best of them uh, and I want the biggest revival. I came here believing God for 5,000 uh, in this area. And that's nothing compared to the size of the city, but that's what I believe for. But as I as I've just keep getting older, nothing matters more than Jude, Jet, Jade, and Jax. And they got to go to heaven. Uh, they got to go to heaven. That's, 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 that's all that matters to me. Let's all stand. Can you thank the panel for their incredible wisdom and time this morning? Thank you guys for taking the time and sacrificing. Feel the presence of the Lord here right now. Let's lift up our hands. Jesus, we love you. 
You see the hunger that's in this room. And you see every person's desires and ideas and dreams and prayers and, and cravings and wants, Lord. And I'm asking you that something that's been spoken today will go home with every person. And as they're on the plane or in the car, that the words of one of these speakers would enter into their spirit as your word for them personally. I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to hedge around them, God. And I pray that something would happen from what was spoken today that, that transforms them and connects them to what the next step is in their ministry or their relationship with you. I pray you bless their homes, their marriages, their children, their lives in Jesus' name. Somebody said amen. 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 Well, thank you guys for your time. Tonight is going to be <laughs> my new favorite message we preach tonight. I can't wait to hear my new favorite message. I don't know what it's going to be, but it's my new favorite message, and I can't wait to hear it. We work on our messages together. He, he gives me this amazing stuff, and I'm like, I put one, one little thing there, and I'm like, wow, this is powerful. They're going to think I'm amazing. And uh, until he preaches at a general conference or something, then you're like, oh. But we're going to hear an incredible word from the Lord tonight. It's going to be explosive. We're going to have a wonderful time. Pastor Viegas is going to speak first, and then Pastor Tuttle. Uh, the bishop of this church is coming tonight. He'll be here at 7 o'clock. I want him to sit right there. I don't know how long he'll stay. I don't know how long he'll stay, but I want to honor him tonight. I hope that's okay with all of you for letting us have the conference here. And we're going to do that in Jesus' name. Amen. I bless you. I hope somebody's there. Go get some lunch. Go get a nap. See you tonight. <laughs>